Uh, this is Goresh uh, Salagram, am I saying it correctly? Uh, President and CEO of Weatherford, the uh, energy services company. Um, I, I think we should stay clear of the debate because they're going to be using these throughout the year uh, after ATAPEC here uh, in terms of our round table. We can have the same conversation. Um, but we've learned a lot from the pandemic. It was such a shock to the global system uh, for supply chains. Uh, is it a permanent shock where people are going to be onshoring, nearshoring, and then offshoring as an option? How much is it changing? How much can you see of the change? I think for me, John, the way I think about it is <clears throat> the permanent change is really ensuring flexibility into your supply chains. And it's, you know, it's really all of the above kind of a situation. You've got to have capability to really have a global supply chain, but you've also got to have very localized supply chains for certain things, but you've got to have the ability to shift on a dime. That's, I think, what the pandemic's really taught us. So you've got to have suppliers around the world, this notion of alternative suppliers. And if you have a disruption in a particular region, you can go to another part of the world, get that same supply and find a way to route it to where you need to, uh, to get it to. So I, I think these concepts, you know, nothing is permanent in the world, but I think are a new definition and a new way of doing things, driving local supply chains, but making sure they're globally interconnected. So to me, this notion of globalization hasn't gone away, but it's much more around visibility and information and data flows. But the physical movement is a lot more you know, within, within regional boundaries to a certain extent. A lot of people would say from the outside, that looks pretty simple, but it, as an oil and gas services company and, and energy services provider, uh, as you're evolving, uh, you need to have really tough, stringent requirements for product, right? And that's not easy. How are you solving that? Yeah, so the first thing is to really develop your supply chain. I think, you know, and I take the analogy of what our customers have done with us. One of the things that I'm absolutely in awe of and I respect from our, all of our customers is the amount of time they devote and dedicate to their suppliers. They call us partners in really making sure that our capabilities are well honed. We have got to do the same with our suppliers and make sure that we are helping them grow, teaching them about the standards, making sure that they understand the qualification process and really having dialogue. And that's the most important thing, engaging with them at an operating level, but also at the same time learning from them that maybe our way is not always the best way. What are the new ideas that they have? What are the ways that they can look across our systems and our processes and say we can add value into it. But really look, after all of that though, it has to be, to your point, a very rigorous adherence to standards. You've got to make sure the right quality comes in and that's through a you know, very rigorous supplier qualification program. And not just on our suppliers, but their sub-suppliers as well. So we've got to go a couple of layers down into the chain to make sure that entire supply chain is robust. There's an initiative in the UAEs, have it uh, making the UAE, right, uh, as a objective, uh, and that does feed into the supply uh, chain strategy. Uh, you're, you're doing a facility here. Absolutely, look, we've had a facility in Abu Dhabi, not just in the Emirates, in Abu Dhabi for a long time. It's, we call it our Abu Dhabi Manufacturing Facility, uh, or ADM for short. It is. Uh, been an important part of the company, but it's now taking an even more pivotal role. And we are calling it our flagship, one of our flagship centers uh, around the world. What's exciting about it is we're not just supplying for the Emirates. We're making it here in the Emirates. We're not just supplying ad hoc, but we're actually exporting from here regionally, but also now globally to different parts of the world. So that's really exciting. We actually just announced an expansion of the facility as part of the awards that we have won from ad hoc over the past year. Uh, ad hoc announced last year at Adepec the largest downhole completions uh, award. And we were very honored to be a part of that. And that's led to a significant investment. So we're investing over 40 million dirhams into this facility on top of a 350 million dirham investment that we've already made in the facility, expanding capacity by over 30%, uh, you know, bringing it close to about 30,000 square meters. So this is a huge facility and it's really critical for us, not just for the Emirates, but globally. But along with that facility, we're also making sure we've got a robust supply chain around it with local suppliers. And that's something that is critical to ensure that stability and security of supply. I wanted to finish up our conversation on the trilemma, the energy trilemma, uh, and energy security. If you looked at the bar chart, went up, you know, because of the alarm of Russia, Ukraine. Uh, you have affordability, which has been a strain in Europe because of the spike in gas prices, uh, and then there's sustainability. From your vantage point, can we get the mix 
more balanced going forward? Look, I think it's, um, it's something that we've got to really work towards. Um, I think it's absolutely doable. It's not going to be instantaneous, uh, but we've got to work hard at it, right? The last several years have seen a significant amount of underinvestment into the sector, which has driven some of these you know, disconnects and dislocations between supply and demand. And so we've got to make sure we bring that investment level back up. But while we are doing that, we can't just do it the way we did it in the past, we've got to ensure that the right returns are there so that that affordability doesn't shock that system. We can have it and we can sustain it over the long term. While we're doing that, sustainability has got to also really come in from an ESG standpoint and making sure that we are responsible, we are driving down emissions, we are reducing our carbon footprint and allowing our customers to drive down their emissions uh, with that. So we've got to do all of it. So you're right, it is a trilemma. We've got to work at it from multiple angles. It's going to take some time, but I absolutely think the industry has the technology, the capability, the know-how. What we really need is collaboration and trust not just within the industry and the ecosystem within the industry, but with external stakeholders, especially governments, with public sector, with banks, et cetera. The whole ecosystem needs to come together and work collaboratively towards it. Um, do we almost need like a, a global footprint? I'm not saying another organization, but we have the United Nations, the World Bank, IMF, the regional development banks, but are they fit for the 21st century to the global moonshot we need for climate mediation in your view? Can you do a better job of mapping resources and getting communities together? It seems that that's a void today. Look, I think it is a bit of a void. Um, I've never, you know, I'm, I'm, first of all, some of this goes into the political sphere, which I'm not uh, uh, certainly an expert at, but I think it's all about having constructive dialogue across all of these different institutions and making sure that it is not marred by ideological differences and it comes together for a common purpose, which is serving humanity, both from an energy security standpoint, as well as making sure that the planet is around for our grandchildren and beyond in a sustainable fashion. So I think we've got to have that constructive dialogue across stakeholders. I think the institutions, to your point, were not designed for that. They were designed for a lot of other things. Mm. And so- Post-World War II architecture. Right, exactly. And so now how do we leverage though the fact that they are there, they have the infrastructure, they've got extremely competent and capable people who understand how the world works, but to say now let's look a new facet because today's challenges are not what they were 50, 60 years ago, even though there are some echoes of the same stuff uh, coming back, but we've got to confront a completely new reality and hopefully leverage the infrastructure that we have built versus saying, let's just start all over again, because it is really difficult to build that back again today.